because the human mind works at a much faster rate than you think it does. And so you can pull things out and tighten it, tighten and tighten. And the tighter you get, often the closer to the rhythm you even imagined was. And, and it, you're trying to lock into a rhythm with the audience. This episode is brought to you by the best-selling book, Rise of the Film Entrepreneur, how to turn your independent film into a money-making business. Learn more at filmbizbook.com. I'd like to welcome to the show, Jay Chandrasekhar. How you doing, Jay? I'm doing great. How are you? I'm doing great, man. Thank you so much for for coming on the show, man. I've been a fan of yours, brother, since since I can't even tell you once. Back, obviously, since Super Troopers came out, I pissed myself and continue to piss myself every single time I watch it. So uh, I appreciate that's, you guys yeah, making that. <laughs> that's the, the maximum uh, reaction we are always hoping for. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I wanted you on the show, man, because, uh, you know, Super Troopers and the sequel and many of the other films you've made. I mean, specifically, Super Troopers was kind of like this indie you know, it was kind of like the beginning. Like, if you remember the 90s, it was like every week there was a new El Mariachi or Brothers yeah. McMullen or Clerks. Yeah. Brother, a Broken Lizards was that for the early 2000s is one of those films that kind of just came out of nowhere from, you know, a group of filmmakers who really nobody knew and exploded on the scene. So before we get into that, how did you get started and why did you want to get started in this insanity that is the film industry? Well, I was an actor in, in high school and college, um, almost not an actor. I, my sister was, I was kind of like a little lost in high school in my freshman year. And my sister's like, why don't you just get in the play? It's super fun. You make a lot of friends. And I'm like, a play? I don't know. Like, what am I going to do? Like act? And she goes, be, a, be a, like an extra, be in the chorus or something. I'm like, all right. So I auditioned for a play to get in the chorus, I guess. And I didn't make it. And I'm like, I was like, what? I didn't make it. And so the next time they put up a play, I auditioned again and I got in, I had a couple lines. And it was really, it was rejection that made me dive back in the second time. I'm like, how dare you? Uh, and once I started doing it, I thought, oh God, this is incredible. This is really fun. And I was, so, and I became like kind of the, one of the main guys in the, in the theater group in high school. And then in college, I was starting the lead in place. Uh, and then I looked at the television and movie uh, screens uh, in the, it was in the late eighties. And I was like, Hey, there are no Indians on there. I mean, the Ben Kingsley was the one Indian and, and they, you know, they weren't going to make a Gandhi too. Right. So I was like, well, when they wanted Indians, they put, you know, white guys in brown face and they, and these guys did these hilarious accents. I thought like uh, Fisher Stevens and. Uh, wow. Yeah. You, you, that did that does that age well at all. It's, it's short circuit. Well, it's funny, short circuit. My dad told me, he goes, he goes, you have to see short circuit. And I said, why? He goes, there's an Indian in it. And I'm like, yeah, it's not a real Indian. He goes, well, it's as close as we'll get. And hey, I'm listen, like, Wait. I, I'm ki- <laughs> look, I'm Cuban and uh, Scarface. I mean, so right. there you go. <laughs> That's such a good point. Uh, um, <laughs> Peter Sellers played a good Indian in the party, I thought. I thought he did yeah. a really <laughs> nice job. Uh, but, I, you know, like... Indians were showing up, but they were the guys who were selling Brad Pitt the uh, pack of cigarettes before he went over and, and hooked up with uh, Jennifer Anson or whoever, right? Mm-hmm. I wanted to be the guy who went hooked up with Jennifer Anson. So I decided um, in college, uh, I started a comedy group, uh, um, you know, because I was... I'll, I'll go. I'll, I'll, I don't know. I don't. I don't know how much of this you want, but anyway. Sure. I went. I I was in college as a junior, and I, I decided I'm going to try to make it in show business. And I said the way I'm going to do it is I can make my friends laugh, no problem. But can I make strangers laugh? And so I I moved to Chicago, uh, which is where I'm from. And I spent the summer in Chicago, and then I took a semester off college, and I went to college in Chicago and got credits there. And I immersed myself in the improv comedy world, and I got involved in this thing called the Improv Olympic. And Chris Farley was the top guy at the time, and Dave Keckner, 
And they, I would go see their shows, their improv shows, and they were incredible. Like, just like it was like magic. It was, you couldn't believe how funny it was. And then I would go do my improv shows with my group, which was like eight beginners. And we would get almost no laughs. I mean, I don't know if we got any laughs. And I thought, well, wow, that's really failing the test of this, uh, can I make strangers laugh? So I decided I better go across town and write some stand-up. And so I, I, I went down an open mic and I did five minutes of stand-up and I got laughs. And I was like, okay. Okay, I passed that test. I'm going to do it. And so I got back to Colgate and um, there was an opportunity to start a comedy group. Uh, it was basically like, hey, you want to direct a one act? And I said, instead, I'll start a comedy group. And so I went around and you know, like Magnificent Seven. I gathered all the funniest people I knew and I put them in a room and I said, here's how we do improv. And I'm like, now I'm like this worst improv improviser in Chicago teaching seven other people how to improvise. And it just didn't go anywhere. Well, first of all, we had no audience. So we were like, is that funny? I don't know. Is that funny? I don't know. And then we're like, you know what? We're all history majors and English majors. Let's just write sketches. Let's do Saturday Night Live. We can do that. And so we started writing sketches and one of the guys who I hired was from Los Angeles, a freshman. And he goes, I know, I really am pretty good with this camera. And so we're like, okay, we'll be like Saturday night, but we'll shoot short videos. So we started shooting short videos and we put on a show. And the first night, about 30 people showed up. And, but it was, it was a good show, I thought. Uh, and the next night it was 400 and you couldn't get enough seats in. And the next night was sold out and the next night was sold out. We're like, oh my God, this thing is really caught on. And so we did another show and then we moved to New York and we reformed as Broken Lizard. And that was 1990. And I'm watching what was happening in the film business. And I'm like, so all yeah. these people are just Kevin Smith. Who's that guy? And Eddie Burns, what's going on with that guy? Rick Linklater. And I'm like, you know, maybe the only way I'm going to get, because still there were no Indians on the screen. And I'm like, maybe the only way I can get into a movie would be if I wrote it myself. So we wrote a movie together. And then I'm like, I, you know, I, we had an experience at Comedy Central with another director who directed us. And I'm like, it didn't really feel right. And so I'm like, maybe I should learn how to direct so that, and I'd been directing all these little short films for Broken Lizard. So I kind of had a leg up. And so we raised money and we made a half an hour film and then, we raised more money and we made Puddle Cruiser, which got into Sundance. And it was just us, me and my friends in the movie. Uh, and that group obviously then went on to make Super Troopers. Um, and, you know. And the rest, as they say, is history. It's so funny that you say you like you were looking at the 90s. And for people who, who listen to this show, they, many of them are younger who don't understand what the 90s in independent film was. It was the first time you really saw the technology as so cheap. And the opportunity for the festivals and Sundance and that Sundance decade to blow up, you know, filmmakers, there was just a window of about 10 years, really, that you could do that, that gave you the inspiration to go, I think I could do this because if, if, if. If, if Kevin Smith made clerks for $27,000 and it's funny as hell, good writing and everything. Yeah. Well, how, why can't I do that? I'm funny. It's similar. Right. Same idea. That's exactly right. If it's very much like if that guy can do it, we're <laughs> I mean, it was very much like that. And and it was uh, no. the truth is the you know, the landscape was littered with the bones of filmmakers who didn't make it. Oh, and still are, sir. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but we you know, I, I've always been somewhat like like cocky to the point of stupidity um which you have uh, to be you have to be in this business to to attempt to write and direct your own film and shove yourself into the middle of it (laughs) And help right. <laughs> which 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 brings there. So you made your short film, which was a, it was a Super Troopers. It was called Super Troopers Three. No, no, the first no the One, first first short film, film was called the Tinfoil Monkey Agenda. Oh, the, the first of all, fantastic name, movie. fantastic no, name, movie. fantastic uh, name. The second, <laughs> uh, the first feature film was called Puddle Cruiser. Right. Uh, took place at Colgate, uh, and then the the film after that was Super Troopers One. I'm right. writing Super Troopers Three right now. With nice. The game, with the game. Not here. So, so Puddle Cruiser. So that was kind of like your clerks. That was the, that was your, that was yeah. going to be that first film that was going to like, and you got into Sundance, which is a huge accomplishment. We got into Sundance and, and uh, Harvey Weinstein saw it and was, you know, tested it and uh, it, it tested, it tested well, but he didn't end up buying it. Mm. And he's like, I want to make it into a TV show because he just had a, a deal with ABC. So he's like, you got to make it a TV show. And then uh, we ended up making it 
in, into a TV show with another company and another guy. But but uh, we came like inches from being uh, uh, purchased by Miramax. Just didn't act. He wasn't in the room at the right time. Fair enough. Fair enough. Now, when you made Puddle Cruisers, I mean, that's the first time you made a, a narrative feature, you know, as a director. What was the biggest lesson you learned on a directing side making that first feature? Well, you know, the thing about comedy is it's all about uh, rhythm and timing. And mm -hmm. if you watch those, uh, you know, I keep mentioning cancel people, but if you watch Woody Allen's uh, great work, um, he'll have three minute takes where the actors are creating his comedic rhythm. And I'm, I'm sure he's telling them faster, 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 faster. And he, I mean, he'll, he had his, he has a take in one of his films where two people are arguing in the living room. They walk into the kitchen, the camera just points at the kitchen while they keep arguing. Then they walk back after about a minute of arguing in the kitchen. And the reason it works is because the rhythm, right? And so I always had a sense, I mean, I, I don't know, it, maybe if you're a comic, you know that it's all about rhythm. And I was like, I think this movie is going to work based on the rhythm we've written into the script, but I don't know. And so we would shoot these scenes and I'm like, yeah, 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 this feels right. This sounds right. Right. And then we cut it all together. I'm like, yeah, yeah, there it is. But, but what we learn most is that there's so much um, extra stuff uh, and space that you need to try, you know, cause the human mind works at a much faster rate than you think it does. And so you can pull things out and tighten it, tighten and tighten. And the tighter you get, often the closer to the rhythm you even imagined was. And, and it, you're trying to lock into a rhythm with the audience. And we were able to do that. So, um, you know, what, what it taught me is that we can, we can do it. Making which, is, which is a very important thing, which then gave you the confidence to make Super yeah. Troopers, which was a, a slightly larger budget. It was 1.1 million. How did First you get that? Movie. How did you get that movie? The money? Well, we just asked everybody in Hollywood and they all said no. <laughs> uh, and uh, we were like, no, no, we're the Puddle Cruiser guys. They're like, yeah, I heard you almost sold to Harvey Weinstein, but didn't. Almost. And, uh, <laughs> <laughs> and so, um, you know, we, 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 you know, we went to so many different people and they were like, so let me get this straight. You guys are the cops? And we're like, yeah, we're the Puddle Cruiser guys. They're like, nobody knows who you are. They're like, you know, one guy's like, I'll give you the money. But we put Ben Affleck in as, as the role of uh, Thorny. I'm friends with him. He'll do it. And I'm like, no, no, no. I'm playing that part. And he goes, good luck with that. And they, we, and we would, we went from place to, you know, we were repped at uh, CAA at the time. And they introduced us to all their financiers and they introduced us. And, and we got close again. We, like the, uh, we were friends with the Zucker brothers so that they introduced us to the Farrelly brothers and the Farrelly brothers tried to get it made at Fox. And they were like, we just, the studio won't <laughs> because you guys, they just won't do it. And uh, we went with Bob Simons uh, who was producing a lot of Adam Sandler films. And he goes, I'm doing it. We're doing it for 5 million. I'm like, great. And then if Bob couldn't get paid the amount he wanted to get paid in the budget. And so he's like, sorry guys, I can't do it. And I'm like, Oh, Okay, so then God, just all this so back and forth. Back I love people forth. hearing hearing these stories because it's like, oh, you just make, you know, one day you get into Sundance, next day you make Broken Lizards, and the, the money just comes rolling in. Yeah. Like that's not the way it works. So <laughs> then we uh, ended up uh, a, a friend of ours was George Clooney's assistant. Uh, it, we moved to LA, right, and we're like, and we were hanging out with her, we we're partying with her, we we're you know doing ecstasy i don't know anyway whatever we were having fun and uh um and we were sleeping at george clooney's house because she was he was off making the peacemaker i think and, and we were she was alone and she's like i can't sleep in this house alone there are all these paparazzi in the woods and we're like okay so, she, so, she, so we moved in there for a month and did george know this did george know this yeah he knew i mean you know we first <laughs> robes around and his slippers and we go feed his pigs uh that's right knew. yeah pigs that's right <laughs> and uh and we had a ball and uh when he got home he's like you know introduced me to these knuckleheads who are sleeping in my house and so we met him and he goes what are you guys trying to do i'm like well we're trying to do this movie and he read it and he goes this is a great movie i'll produce it for you and i was like oh great okay so now we're <laughs> now we're going we're like we got george Clooney, and um 
I think we asked him to be in it. He goes, I'm just going to produce it for you. I'm like, okay, great. So uh, then we, you know, we're like trying to take that around town. And, you know, the the Jersey Films, which is Dan DeVito's company, sure. is like we're simultaneously trying to create a television show with them um, around Super Troopers because, you know, it didn't make it as a movie. We're, oh, well, let's make it a TV show. Then we are unable to sell that uh to fox we had a, had a pilot oh, to fox right we had a pilot and they were like ah we don't know about you. Ah, we don't know about you guys and they pass so then jersey films like why don't we make it as a movie and i'm like well we're already making it with george clooney they're like great we'll jump on so now we got dan uh, dan devito and george clooney mm-hmm. and two companies and soderbergh is giving us notes on the movie because he's with clooney and soderbergh's mm-hmm. like i don't know about this opening scene i goes i don't even know what this he goes i don't know what's so funny about these cops he goes i think you guys need a new wrinkle to it like you need you know how like in point break they wore those those president of the united states masks he goes maybe Mm -hmm. you could do something like that and i'm like well i kind of hide our faces because we're not famous and but i didn't say that but but we were we were like we're not doing that now uh uh, in any case so then we re-go around to all the studios and they all go, yeah, we already said no to that. We're not doing it just because you guys are on it. Uh, so now we're like, what the hell? Uh, and all the independent people said no. And, and, and <laughs> you know, and so finally we're like, I'm in my office. Uh, pack- I had a New York office and I, was, I had moved to L.A., but I was going there to bring everything back. So I'm packing the office up. I'm getting ready to gotta unplug the phone. I get, it's done. I'm moving out. And the phone rings. And I pick it up and it's my friend Cricket. And she goes, hey, um, I hate to do this to you, but, you know, my father's a, a investment banker and he's he's retiring and he wants to write scripts. And you're the only one I know is kind of in show business. And I'm like, yeah, kind of cricket. And uh, he goes, do you mind just talking to him? He wrote a script and he needs somebody to, else to look at it, I guess. And I'm like, all right, I'll do it. All right. And so I get on the phone with this guy and he's like, he goes, you write scripts? He's like total banker, kind of like a tough guy. And I'm like, yeah, 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 we've written a couple. He goes, all right, well, I wrote a script too. And I'm like, oh, great. Don't make me read it, but I know you will. Uh, and then he's like, um, I guess I'll send it to you, but why don't you send me your script first so I can just see what kind of writers you are? And I'm like, oh, I'm being auditioned to read this terrible script. Is that what's happening? But I like cricket and I kind of you know, want to kiss her. So I'm like, you know, but, and I didn't kiss her. But anyway, so I send I send the um, uh, script over to this guy and he, uh, you know, a few days later, he calls me back and, you know, I haven't unplugged the phone yet. And he goes, I read your script. I said, oh, great. And I'm waiting for him to go, okay, now now I get to read your script. And he goes, it's pretty funny. And I'm like, yeah, oh, thanks. He goes, what are you doing with it? I said, well, he, he's a banker. Right? We're raising money. He goes, how much you need? I said, uh, we need a million two six. That's our budget. And he goes, all right, I'll do it. And I'm like, what? <laughs> and so I hang up the phone. I walk into my producer's office. I'm like, I got this good banker on the phone. I think I want to do the move. And he goes, I would, and my producer was an uh, uh, investment banker too. He goes, I'll tell you, get this guy on the phone. I'll, tell, I'll find out, you know, I'll, I'll, I'll be able to suss him out. And he gets on the phone. And he goes, uh huh. Okay, right. I, uh, oh, uh. and then he hangs up. He goes, I is a real deal guy. And within, Within about two weeks, no, in the bank, no, the money dropped within two. I've never heard of a movie drop money dropping that fast. I'm funding the deal, let's do it. That's how he looks at it. He goes, When I say I'm funding the deal, the money goes in the thing, and boom, 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 boom. (laughs) Wow, that is what that is called just some some force in the universe just said it's time for these boys to to go make their movie because well, i've never heard of a story like that run them all the way to the end where they're Let's just, literally unplugging the phone and, and then and, just just as a, as a joke we'll just go here's one last <laughs> <laughs> but you got to pass the test which is to be nice to cricket <laughs> right, because if you so basically we you, we and I wouldn't be sitting here right now. God knows where your career would have been if you wouldn't have been nice to cricket. I would have been the the uh, Indian guy in the deli selling cigarettes to Brad Pitt when he goes to have sex with uh, whoever. <laughs> they're, they're really funny. They're really funny guys. Yeah, they so. might give you a line. <laughs> no, they might give uh, you a line. I I um, 
it, it may not be true, but I, I call myself the uh, Indian Jackie Robinson of, of comedy. And it's because there were no there were no uh, Indians in comedy. Right. Mm-hmm. And uh, I got in and I, 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 a lot of them have come up to me and been like, hey, you, I saw you on the screen. I thought, hey, I could do that, too. And, uh, you know, Aziz and Mindy and all these folks. I mean, if you look at the wave, there was me and then everybody came in and they're doing great work. I mean, look at all these great people. So, yeah. Um, but you were the Jackie I, Robinson, sir. You were the Jackie Robinson. I did not, yeah. I mean, you know, nobody hurled things at me from the stands or called me. There's off that. Me. There's that. But uh, but you did have to sit in a room with Harvey Weinstein. So there's that. You know, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it's, it was it was quite it was actually quite thrilling. I didn't know, obviously, all the stuff he had done. I, uh, no, I, look, no, everybody, every, I mean, everyone could trash him now because he's a monster and all that. But in the nineties, he was a god. Yeah, I, I don't trash Harvey Weinstein. I, I mean, he's uh, what he was doing was awful. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, but you know, there there were a lot of people around who seemed to know what he was. Some Pretty version much. of what he was doing. Mm-hmm. Like it was just what the boss did. And you're like, oh, I don't. And there's don't and there's a lot of that stuff that happens in Hollywood. I, I've heard stories running around town about that since I was starting out. So it's something that hopefully has changed a bit. But I think it has changed. I think it uh, has a tremendous, a, a tremendous amount since uh, since the 90s and early 2000s, without question. All right. So you get Super Troopers funded by a miracle. Miracle. You're shooting. What is it? What is it like shooting? How like did how did the production go smoothly? How did it run? It had to did go you- smoothly because we only had the money for 28 days of shooting. <laughs> like he's like, I'm, in, in, in fact, it, Pete Langell put in a million two, not a million two six. He's like, that's all I'm giving you. And so I put in 30 in credit card and Rich Perella, my producer, put in 30 in credit card. And we were like, hanging on by a threat uh and you know like the weather had to go well the film i mean we shot on film it had to be you know everything had to go well and it and it and it did it went it went according to plan and then we you know we cut it together and um you know it was sundance was uh, was interested in the film because of the previous thing but we were so close to the deadline that it was, it was, you know, like we had shot it, we shot it in June and the Sundance deadline was, you know. September, yeah. September, so we cut it together, we put it together, we sent it in and I was in, uh, I can't remember, uh, anyway, whatever. We got the call, you get it at Thanksgiving. They say they say you're in or you're out or they don't call you. Uh, uh, But the, uh, we got the call that we were in and we were like, oh my God, we have to finish this movie in time. And uh, we're not sure we can even do, because we were the Do Art Film Lab and you had to schedule it. All the films that got in were rushing. And so we just just finished it, right? And in fact, it was so close that we we ended up um, in the Do Art Film Lab on the morning that we were flying to uh, Salt Lake City. To get your print. Um, to, we were watching the final print. And I was sitting in that room with Kevin Heffernan, who played Farva, and the color timer. And we're watching it. And we're watching it. And like we watched the first, uh, the opening scene of the, of Super Troopers. Uh, if you haven't seen it, like, oh, yeah. Yeah. I'm a cop. And uh, I know you've seen it, but I guess I'm trying to yeah. And uh, and another friend, and we pull over some stoners and we and we mess with them. Uh, and there's some other things happen. So um, uh, and it's you know <laughs> it, it has gone on to become the scene which we're known most for. I would say, like you know, like they're like it, it's the scene that describes Broken Lizard's comedy, I think quite well. And people were like, "That's you guys." Okay, so um, I watched that scene. And the title of the film comes up, Super Troopers. And I'm like, can we can we turn the lights on for a second? And they stop the film. And I stand up and I look at Kevin. I'm like, we blew it. <laughs> and I it said, that, that opening scene sucks. And he goes, what are you talking about? And I'm like, it's terrible. I mean, why did I act like that? I don't know. What? Ooh, nobody want to tell me that I was acting like that? And he goes... I think it's pretty good, dude. I'm like, what the hell do you know? And the color timer goes, I think it's pretty good too. I'm like, you know what, pal? It's not. 
and we got to go to Utah tomorrow and show this fucking terrible thing. Right. And I'm like, ah, oh, doom. I was just feeling doom. Wow. And in, and in fact, the opening scene of Puddle Cruiser is the is the worst scene in the movie. It's just OK. You know, it's like mm-hmm. like it, with comedies, you want to get them laughing fast so that mm-hmm. you can keep them laughing. And they're like, oh, yeah, we're laughing. We're supposed to laugh. So I was like, we, we tried so hard to make Super Troopers a good opening scene. It was just we, because of how bad the opening of Puddle Cruiser was. We, the Puddle Cruiser opening was so it wasn't bad. It was just slow and whatever. We used to take a, a, a marionette uh, like a, it was Jimmy the dummy. Right. And he was mm-hmm. like a little ventriloquist guy. And we did a whole scene at the first uh, Sundance with this dummy where, you know, like one of us would go up on stage and go, hey, the film print broke and we're getting a new one shipped in from Salt Lake. The whole packed audience and the audience would grow and they go, ah, but it's coming, it's coming. We'd make up this thing. And then the dummy, like somebody on the, on the, in the audience would go, unprofessional. That was one of us, right? And then another guy would be like, hey, leave him alone. And there's this guy with a ventriloquist dummy and they go, what? I think these guys are young filmmakers and they're trying really hard. And then the guy, hey, you shut up, you dummy. And then everybody would yell at each other. And then a guy in a UPS uniform, one of my guys, would come running in. I got the film. And he'd run oh, in and he'd grip brilliant. and it would unspool everywhere, right? And oh. the audience is laughing and laughing. And then we start the movie and they're laughing and then they go. I was like, to Kevin, I'm like, we got to go back to my... Uh, house right now. We'll take the cab, go back to pick up Jimmy the dummy. We're doing the thing of sketch again. And he goes, we're not doing it. We're just showing it. And I'm like, gosh, dude. <laughs> and so then we go to Park City and we're in a bar and um, I'm and sitting in the bars, Harvey Weinstein. And I'm like, oh, we got to get this guy in the screening, right? And so we send um, uh, Marissa Coughlin, who's in the movie, and she knows him. And she's, he's, she's, he's like, he's like, come on over. And so we, was, I'm telling the story of this criminal now. So um, and so Harvey and and he's like, look, Jay, I, I'd love to go to your movie, but I got a meeting right in the middle of it. I can't. If I go to your movie, and I leave, you're not selling your movie. And I'm like. I know, but if, if I said, well, just, well, I'll put you in the back seat, just sneak out. And then, you know, he goes, okay, I'll come to your movie, put me in the back seat. I'll sneak out and I'll come back. And I'm like, great, let's do it. And so we do it. We put him in the back seat, back uh, row. The place is packed with really high and, and, and kind of drunk people too, because it's like a midnight screening. And we know a lot of people in LA and New York, everyone's like, yeah, revved up, right? And they all turn and look at Harvey Weinstein and they go, whoa, right? Oh, uh, shit. He's here. Holy shit, he's here, right? And so he's sitting in the back. The movie starts. I'm like, oh, it's going to be terrible. And immediately the laughs start rolling and rolling. And then, I mean, and it rolled. And then when that title came up, the place blows up into a, an ovation and tears rolled down my face because I was so tense. I was so tense. And then I'm like pacing in the lobby as I'm listening to the movie laughter. And Harvey gets up around the 30 minute mark. He goes, this movie is killing. He goes, I'm coming back. And he he leaves, goes to his thing and he comes back and he slides right in. He goes, incredible. And at the end of the movie, he goes, come over, talk to me, talk to me. He goes, I'm not going to necessarily buy your film yet because I haven't seen it all, but this is going to help you. He goes, you watch what happens here. Uh, and he goes, in fact, I want you to meet me at this bar and you watch what you'll be in. The, you'll be in the daily, whatever, the page six. I'm like, OK, so we meet him at this bar. Right. And 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 I'm, I'm there and like whatever. We're kind of chatting. I'm like, just buy the movie because I got to watch it first. Give me the print. So we're kind of doing that thing. And I'm at the bar and executives from Searchlight and executives from Sony are like, don't sell. Don't sell to Harvey. Let us. We need more people to come see it. Don't sell to Harvey. Don't sell. And, and in fact, it created this frenzy. And, then, and we showed it again Saturday night and we showed it again Sunday night. And Searchlight made an offer of three and a half. And we're like, Harvey, you want to beat that? Or we, Sony, you want, whatever. And Searchlight's like, the offer expires when your Sunday night screening starts. So take it or leave. And we're like, we'll take it. <laughs> we'll take it. Thank God we took it from Searchlight because we had such a nice career with those guys. And we never had to deal with 
you know, Harvey uh, Scissorhands, which is what he was called by a lot of filmmakers who went in and recut. I mean, look, mm -hmm. obviously he did a lot worse things than recut movies, but uh, I, I always uh, I'm grateful that I never fell into his uh, his his hands. Right. Uh, but uh, but you, but at least uh, he did whatever he did for you back in the day. Yeah. That, and it's yeah, going to it. see. Yeah, it started yeah. the conversation. It did. It's that's that's an amazing story. So you, you tripled your budget and your career was off the ground. Now I have to ask you. I mean, it turned into a huge hit. I mean, it was and not only a huge financial box office hit, but then DVDs back then. And it made, and, it made, it made Fox over a hundred million dollars. Jesus. A million dollar movie. Oh, they they kept almost every penny of it. I was about to say almost every single penny. I'm like, I'm sure that they didn't get that. <laughs> but, but so let me ask you a question. I always love asking filmmakers who, who get this kind of situation happen to them. This kind of lottery. T I call it the lottery ticket. Because yeah. it's like it it's, it is it a is. lottery. It's a lottery ticket moment that you worked very hard for. It's not like you was lucky to get it, but all these circumstances that happened, like crickets, <laughs> father <laughs> who gives you the money, and yeah. then Sunday. There's a lot of these things that happen. Um, how did the town treat you as the director of this film afterwards? The, what happens is there's a period of of heat. Right. Mm -hmm. So we instantly got two uh, television deals, one with the NBC and one with uh, ABC. Uh, you know, like we we entered into, uh, you know, Searchlight wanted our next film, which would become Club Dread. Um, and, you know, we were I was in the conversation around town as one of the new guys. Um, but. I wasn't pursuing that. I didn't even know how to pursue it because I was like, I would read these, you know, often not great comedy scripts. And I go, <laughs> well, I don't know. I can't make a not great movie. It didn't occur to me that I could then put my imprimatur on it and rewrite it. And just mm -hmm. have my guys rewrite it or we rewrite. It. I didn't even know that. I was like, well, if it's this now, then I can't make that movie. That's how kind of dumb I was. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I passed on a lot of good movies that turned into good movies. Um, and then I thought, oh, well, you know what? This is a, an idea for a film, this movie. And I'll just take it and I'll rewrite everything. And, and then it'll be the same movie, but it'll be about my version of it, which would be, in my opinion, a good one. You know, now I, that's what I do now. Um, uh, and, but then, yeah, I was I was like one of the guys who, you know, I was on variety top 10 directors to sure. watch, you know, all that stuff. But you but went through the water line, bottle. So you went yeah. through the water bottle tour. You just went. Every, right. the, you met the, everybody. The, the bottom line is uh, the film business is a largely self-generating business. And if you relax and be like, I made it. I'm on the top 10 directors. So it's meaningless. It's like, yeah, some producer might call you and go, Hey, can you do something with this? They're still trying to get the money. And you know, if you're not generating yourself, if you're not out there going, I want to make a movie about this and this, and this, and I'm going to write it. And this here's the script. And this is the writer is going to do it. We're going to do it together. And you know, if you're not doing that. You're not getting movies made. Still, still at any level. Uh, and I mean, even yeah, Spielberg, I mean, Spielberg can get some things made, but he still has to develop and build and do things like that. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, he has a little easier, but yeah, a little uh, bit, a little bit, a little bit <laughs> easier know, than the rest uh, of us. It, it, it leads me to this. Uh, I don't want to jump <laughs> off your train yet, but uh, if you want to continue, we can. But I have a Spielberg sure. Story. Oh, I love Spielberg. I have so many people who've worked with Spielberg on the show. I, and he, it seems to me that he always he's always in the mix somehow with any, any, any big thing that happens in town. You always get the call from, even if it's just like, Hey man, great movie. What was your, what's your Spielberg story? Well, I was, I was sitting at home in the pandemic and I uh, basically had turned into like a full-time golfer. Like I, I played every day. Uh, and I was just sort of there and I get this call uh, from my agent that said, Hey, what do you know about Joe Coy? And I said, well, Joe Coy, the, the, the comic. I mean, he's a funny, funny dude, right? And he said, well, okay, here's the deal. Joe Coy uh, has done a stand-up special on, on Netflix. And Steven Spielberg, during the pandemic, happened to watch it. And he loves Joe Coy. And now he's like, 
wants to make a Joe Coy movie and they want to do it in Vancouver and they want to, and they, and you got to go any day now because uh, the film can only be shot in May and June because that's Joe Coy's stand up window where he's got stand up shows all over the world and the big shows. So, and I'm like, big shows, really? Like, you know, he sells out 16,000 seat arenas. I was like, oh. Oh, oh. Joe Coy. okay and uh and i'm like okay so may june so we gotta be in vancouver when monday and they're like yeah kind of and uh, i mean and i'm like okay send so me the scripts so i read the script and i'm like okay i get it i mean i i know joe's stand up and it's a it's like attempting to be about his his family mm-hmm. and i'm like yeah I said, you know, look, this script, uh, were I to do it, would need uh, some work, but it's not work that can't be done. So I said, yeah, I'll go. Uh, well, I mean, because they, they, Amblin was asking for me to go. And I said, yeah, I'll do it. So I, I flew to Vancouver and, uh, and went into quarantine for two weeks in a, in a, ho- in a hotel, very nice hotel. Um, uh, but it was hard, uh, where I couldn't see anybody. I couldn't step over the, e- the, the, the entrance to the, I just stayed in that room. Uh, and then I got out and, uh, Joe Coy came to town and I met him for the first time. I mean, I, we'd met on zoom and we, you know, I hired a writer and, and she and I, uh, rewrote the thing. And, um, and then, you know, I still haven't met Steven Spielberg. I just, because of the quarantine and the COVID thing, I get a note from him every now and then, like, movie stars don't wear hats. And I'm like, okay, you can't wear a hat in the next scene, buddy. Uh, uh, See, you know, Steven, Mount Olympus called and you can't. Well, it, you know, like we were going to hire an actress for a part and, uh, uh, and we sent it to him, the choice. And, it, you know, she was the more famous person. Right. And I've been at Warner Brothers for years. I had a deal over there and they're like, just hire the most famous person. We'll put them on the poster and you'll make it work. And I'm like, okay. I just assumed everybody did that. And so I'm like, I, you know, I gave him the choice, the most famous person. And he, he, he sends a note back. This other woman's much better actor than the most famous person, don't you think? And I'm like, well, yeah, but she's not the most famous person. And he goes, when you want to choose a better actor, I'm like, of course I do. I didn't know I could. I did. So then I did. And it, it's the it's the central decision for the whole movie. Like, it, because we hired this woman, the movie works in a way you can't even believe, in my view. It's called Easter Sunday. But the right, guy yeah. has this, you know, you know, he, he's not just some rando. He's like, who just said, oh, my name's on it. He's like, what about that? And what do you think about that? And you're like, OK, great. I still and never I, met him, but, you know. But I'm assuming one day you'll get a phone call, maybe. Uh, you know, I will I will I will go to my grave, not assuming I'm going to meet Steven Spielberg, even though he's my boss. I just don't I don't see how that could happen. You know, I, Alex, I live in a world where I'm like constantly convinced I'm about to be kicked out of show business. So there's no there's no space in that world for me to believe that I will meet Steven Spielberg. So is right. it, is that, it's, I always love asking this question from from, you know, people who've hit a certain level in the business is like, do you do you? So you just said you truly believe that at any moment security is going to come in. Like, what are you doing here? You need to be escorted out. <laughs> right. I, right. It, 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 I look, I realize how ridiculous it is because <laughs> I was I did a stand up show recently and it was me and Tiffany Haddish uh, yeah. and Anthony Jeselnik and Tom Arnold. And we're upstairs, we're just chatting, four comics chatting. And I'm like, <laughs> moments like these where, my, uh, uh, where, where I have to admit that I might have made it. Um, and I, I hate to admit that because I'm mm-hmm. so hungry and I'm so, they don't so- want me in show business. <laughs> um, I'll show them, I'll make, a, I'll make my 10th movie. <laughs> <laughs> No, I have to ask you. So um, that's fantastic, by the way. I was going to bring you up Easter Sunday because I saw Easter Sunday and we've been working on this interview for months now. And then all of a sudden I'm like, oh, Easter Sunday's coming out. I'm like, and I'm such a Joy Koi fan. I'm like, oh. I absolute huge Joy Koi fan. Okay. Uh, and I've had I've had the pleasure of meeting him. We almost worked together on this close of almost working together years ago. Uh, and Joe is just wonderful. It's just, I'm such a, such a fan of his. Um, but super troopers two is such a unique story and how you got that made because the studio didn't want to make the sequel and you had to raise the money yourself, right? They were worried that it was too long, um, mm-hmm. between 
films. Fair right. enough. You know, uh, first one came out in 2002. The second one might have come out in 2016. Mm-hmm. Um, or 18 or something. I don't know. But it was, it was, it was a long time. They were like, ah, I don't know. And they're like, so they said, well, why don't you raise the money yourself? And we said, really? You made a hundred million dollars. You can't just carve a couple off. And they're like, yeah, <laughs> if you raise the money yourself. We'll distribute it. I'm like, okay. And then they said, and you have to raise the prints and advertising budget too which is all the money, it's the budget uh, and all the money to release it. So you're talking about, in this case, we had to raise $30 million. And I'm like, I don't know, I, don't, uh, I can't raise $30 million. Cr- cricket, cricket. Yeah, well, yeah, cricket's dad, cricket's dad's like, I'll put money in. Oh, that's I'll good. Put money. And we put money together. Um, we had like, I don't know, maybe we got to about five or so. And then we were like, kind of hit a wall. Didn't weren't. And they, and they also said, we'll never let you take to another studio because other studios are like, Nef, you know, Netflix, like we'll do it. Um, oh yeah. They like, no, you, can't, you can't take it out of work. No. And we're not making it, but no, you can't take it. So we, happened upon this i mean you know we we watched watch the news we saw these uh the veronica mars had raised some money for uh um the, the movie of that and we thought well god i mean we're at least uh in a similar position you know they had a thing they loved and they're doing a thing mm-hmm. so we we hired the guy who did that campaign this guy ivan um Askoff, and and he he um he put together a can. He first of all, he goes, "I'm not terribly familiar with your work." That's the first thing he said, and I'm like, hey, "You computer guy," and uh, you have no tact or anything. It's so funny. And um, he then he goes, "You know, there's quite a bit of interest in your comedy uh, around the internet. I've done a search," and I was like, "How do you? What? Okay." And he goes, "I'm going to take this job on." I'm like, "Okay." Great. Let's great, do it. Thanks. And built this incredible campaign with great art and incentives. And a, we, we made a video where you like, we locked Farva in the trunk of a, of, of a car. Yeah, in the I remember it. And then we said, give us money or else we won't let him out of the trunk. And then we pushed go on the campaign and it was like, boom. Like, I mean, we, we raised, I think, $5.8 million. Uh, on, on Indiegogo, right? Indiegogo, something like that. We were second to uh, Veronica Mars. Whatever they made, we made a little less. And wow. And Searchlight was like, what? <laughs> what? Oh, how many? 50,000 people gave you money? And they're like, oh, okay. Oh, wow. Great. Um, and then, so then we were able to, so then now they were really excited about it. And, uh, uh, and then they agreed to uh, release the film for us with their money. Uh, oh, that's nice. And so, yeah, so we still funded the production. They, they funded the, you know, but we made the movie and then we tested the movie and the reaction in the audience was like, <laughs> I mean, it was insane, the reaction and all the searchlight executives were there. And when they put the, tw- they take, keep 20 people back to talk to them about the, what, you know, wh- wh- how would you feel about the movie? And, and, the, and they're like, yeah, this is from a franchise. And was a- yeah, so they tested, I tell you about the testing on the screen. Mm-hmm. Yeah, I mean, it, it, it tested incredibly well. Like the numbers were astronomical. The audience was comparing it to franchises like Star Wars. And the Fox people were like, oh my God, we got a hit. Uh, and so, they poured the money in. They did a great campaign, two posters, super cool. Everything was great. And we were like, holy, this is incredible. We're going to, we're going to have a, uh, you know, it looks really good. We're going to have a hit movie, I think. And so then the weekend, the week we arrived in New York, which is what you do at the end of, the, of, a, of a campaign uh, to do press, New York press, we're, it's Monday. And the publicist with us is like, I hate to break it to you guys, but we got really bad tracking on this movie. Like, and the tracking predicts what the box office opening weekend is going to be. And they're like, it's, it's tracking 
to open to about $3 million, right? In order to be a success, this movie would, in Searchlight's view, would he wanted to open to 10. You know, that would be a success for a small film. And we were like, three million, how is that possible? Like we had a 50,000 and they're like, well, you know, like our, our fans have been notoriously stoners, right? They're like a little slow to the mark, a little slow to the mark. <laughs> they get there, they get there. Like they, when I do a stand-up show, there'll be tickets available up until an hour before the Friday. And there are like a hundred tickets available and then boom, it's sold out. And you're like, guys, get, get, get your internet, how can you do this? <laughs> So I'm like, maybe that's it. And they're like, eh, maybe, I don't know. And on Monday, Tuesday, it's still tracking three. Wednesday, it's still tracking three million. And everyone's like, we yeah. think the president of Searchlight calls and goes, hey, man, we tried. I'm sorry. Right. And then Thursday morning, we're in an interview in some brewery or something in Brooklyn or something. And um, Paul Bassist goes, she's looking at her phone. She goes, there's some weird, uh, there's some weird and uh, numbers out of the matinees uh, that, well, they're just not, they're not right. But we're gonna get a check. We're gonna check on. It. And I said, <laughs> what are they? And she's like, well, the, the all the matinees are sold out. And I'm like, yeah, that's that's not true. And so she goes, yeah, there, there's a problem with the computer, the system. There's a problem. Oh, obviously. Obviously. And so then the next screening, she goes, yeah, these stu- these numbers are stupid. They're all sold out. And it, so, so two screenings are now sold out morning at 11 a.m. and one. And she's like, and then the third one, she goes, it's sold out again. <laughs> and they're like, these are real numbers. And suddenly we have now we won Thursday. We won Friday. We're the top movie in the country. And and we had eighteen hundred screens, I think, or something like that. And, and Amy Schumer had. 2,600, 2,800 screens. So we were beating her on per screen average. And then with the volume of screens, they ended up winning the weekend. But we won the per screen average for the weekend with our 1,800 screens. Um, That's amazing. It was a miracle. It was a miracle. And Searchlight's like, let's make two more movies. And then, you know, there we go. And there we go. (laughs) And now that's why now you're writing that's uh, right. Super Troopers 3. We made, a film, we made a film called Quasi, which is set in 13th century France. Uh, uh, and Steve Lemmy plays a hunchback and I play the king of France and uh, Paul Sutter plays Pope. Uh, and it's a full on Monty Python-esque style movie. And sure, people are going to go, you guys aren't as good as Python. And we'll go, we agree. But um, still, uh, we made one. And we said, you know, the, and we were in it with this accent. And you're like, my God, we're in the middle of a Python movie. <laughs> That's amazing. That's amazing. Now, um, Jay, I'm going to ask you a couple questions. I ask all of my guests. Um, what advice would you give a filmmaker trying to break into the business today? Well, my advice would be don't wait around. Uh, for other people to let you in because there are people like me on the other side of the door pressing our shoulders against it to keep you out. <laughs> and, um, and the only way in is through that door. So keep pushing and don't wait for me to let you in. It's not going to happen. It's not going to happen. It's like, I got it's in. On this side. I'm in Vegas in the hotel. That's not good. <laughs> but, you know, I mean, the answer is. Um, That's awesome. We respond to the same things you would think we respond to, which is followers and, uh, and, and numbers. Like if you can demonstrate an audience by making your short films and putting them on the internet and having people watch them, you know, and we go, oh my God, a million people watch. Oh, wow. That's good. Maybe, well, you know, it comes with a built in audience, you know, it's like it, 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 it's not easy, but it's also, you have an ability to tor- sort of, do things cheaply. Um, mm-hmm. Now, the problem for the new generation is that so many people are trying to do things cheaply. There's so much stuff. You're like, it's hard to really get your mind around it. Uh, um, and so, you know, the, the the system benefits those with access to capital, and that's sort of the sad truth of it all, right? If you can if you can raise money. I mean, it's even harder now because like Sundance isn't what it used to be. You know, like right. the people are not companies are not going to Sundance and necessarily buying. I mean, they are, they're buying films, but it's a little different. It's not, you know, you don't have these 
people are automatically into theater. So you have like, oh, we'll stream you a little bit. And, you know, and, and that's all good. And that's all good. But that's sort of the changing moment here. Uh, do, do you think that Super Troopers, what would happen if Super Troopers got released today? It probably would have gone to somebody like Netflix. Maybe. Maybe right. knowing that you that nobody knew who you were, you made a well, million dollar movie. So I, I believe it would have sold because the response in the room was electric. And, and that's really the game, right? If you can get to Sundance and show the movie in a room full of people, you flipped the power dynamic so that the, the buyer, instead of watching it on their desk, on their laptop and drinking coffee and walking around and doing all this stuff, they are now in a room with audience. And the audience is like, we love it. And they're like, oh, no, what do I do? I better buy it. I mean, that's sort of how that works. Mm-hmm. Um, and that still works that way. You know, like I, 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 you can still get a movie in, into the theater. So if you're nobodies and you have no, nobody's in the movie, then it's harder, right? It's like you probably end up on a streaming service first. And maybe you'll never get out of there. I don't, I don't really know. I mean, the problem, with, <laughs> the problem with Netflix is they pay more money than Searchlight does. Mm-hmm. And, and, you know, the, and then the movie ends up being sitting there, you know, lost in the soup. Have, doesn't have the same, when you get a poster <clears throat> and a campaign and interviews and it, you know, the movie sears into audiences brains in a different way. Um, you know, the, the movies on Netflix currently don't do that in my view. And right. Then, yeah. Right. I mean, Top Gun, did what it did because of it did well it did okay yeah it's the biggest memorial day weekend opening ever oh good 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 uh, you know I, the whole so thing good. for me is i want um i, I you know I, I said to universal when we were getting ready to think about how we're going to put out this movie in the middle of the pandemic of course the yeah. movie tested well easter sunday tested really well joe coy is the biggest ticket selling stand-up comic in show business he's number wow. one wow wow sells 56,000 seats in Los Angeles in three nights. He sells 38,000 in Seattle. He is filling hockey arenas everywhere he goes. And I said to them, look, guys, we got a, we got a theatrical co- comedy that works really well. The audiences, we tested it. They love it. We have Joe Coy in his first film. This is like having Steve Martin before The Jerk or Eddie Murphy before 48 Hours. We got him. And you guys are universal and I'm me. Like, if we can't sell this as a theatrical comedy, well, you guys, we should all stop, you know? Because <laughs> I said, we got to be, you know, we're all looking around and go, who's going to bring the theatrical comedy back? You know who it is? It's us. Mm-hmm. We're, we're, we've been put here to do this. This is it. It's our turn. It's time to do it. And so I'm, I've been telling people, I'm like, we're bringing the theatrical comedy back. And we're the only theatrical comedy coming out this summer. That's how bad it's got. You're absolutely right. I mean, yeah, I mean, it is outrageous. And now it's every, like everyone's saying that theaters are just for the event films and they are for a certain extent, of course, but you know, a film like a film, a film like Easter Sunday would absolutely open. Well, I mean, you've got an audience that is used to buying tickets for this artist That's on right. top of it. That's so right. it's like, makes right. sense. We'll see if I'm right. I mean, we'll see if I'm right, but I, but I, I hope I am. I mean, I, you know, it's a gambling business, you know, the, you know, it's gunslingers and gamblers. <laughs> well, we're going. We're we're such big Joy Coy fans. My family and I, all my um, daughters, everyone. So we're gonna we're gonna head out to the theaters to see it when it comes out. Um, do we? Do you know about my the app I created? Are you? Mm, uh, I don't. Ah. Tell me about the app. Tell me about the app. So it all goes back. Super Troopers comes out uh, after this incredible Sundance experience. Comes out in the theaters, uh, and the reviewers uh, on Rotten Tomatoes a site named for throwing rotten fruit at people like me, film site. Um, they give it a 38% fresh, the, oh. the reviewers, right? And I was like, what? What? What do we have to do? Like, and, the, and then that's 100 people. Then over time, you know, the audience weighed in and, and the audience gave us a 90% fresh rate. That's... 200,000 people rated that way. And I'm like, who are these strangers with outsized um, power, right? They're just, they're, you know, a reviewer, I, I got no problem with reviewers, right? I, sure. In fact, I think they're valuable. But aggregating all of them 
in putting it into a score, it's just nonsensical. Like we got reviewed for Beer Fest from a woman in Arizona named Grandma's Reviews. And her review of the film was, I didn't like it. There was too much drinking. I'm like, there's too much <laughs> drinking. It's an ode to binge drinking. Like, it's called Beer Fest. Yes. So, but that goes into our reviewer score. And you're like, I said, oh my God, I need to get revenge on Rotten Tomatoes. And it stewed with me for 18, 20 years. And then I said, I know how I'm going to do it. I'm going to build an app, right? I mean, look, the, the premise is this. Reviewers are strangers. When's the last time you walked up to a stranger on the street and said, hey, hey, what movie should I see? That's what we're doing. That, exactly. And in, in Rotten Tomatoes, you're taking all these strangers, aggregating their strange opinions and putting it together. And there you go. Here's what these strangers think. So I said, you know, I want to build an app that is... You, if you want advice for a movie, you talk to your friends, right? You talk to your friends, your, your, or maybe, you know, some celebrity yeah. on something, some filmmaker said, hey, this is a good movie, Road to Busan or whatever it is, mm -hmm. Train to Busan, I don't know. Uh, and so I made an app. Uh, I started to develop an app that was going to be a recommendation site for movies, TV, books, podcasts, music, right? And I connected with these two guys who were computer guys, and, and they were already reacting to this, uh, you know, like Amazon reviews or Yelp reviews. They're like, who wrote the review? Was it the owner of the restaurant who wrote himself a good review? Was it the restaurant across the street who wrote them a bad review? Was it somebody who doesn't like the waiter who gave them a bad? I mean, you know, you're like, they, you just, they're strangers, right? So they were working on an idea to try to solve that problem. And we teamed up and we made a thing called Vouch Vault. All right. It's in the App Store now. It's in the Apple Store and it's in the Android Store. And the, it's basically this. It's basically Instagram for um, recommendations. So if you open my vault, you'll see that I like Reservoir Dogs. You'll see that I like uh, Pulp Fiction. You'll see that I like Richard Pryor live in Long Beach, that stand up show. You'll see that I like uh, uh, um, what's Joe, his Coy. Name? Yeah. Joe Coy stand up. You'll see. Yeah. I put super troopers there. You see, you know, if I like this indie hustle, you could see that. Like you can put anything you like. And so if you follow me, you're like, oh, Jay likes this thing. And then you push a button and you can try it, right? Uh, but books, anything. I have all sorts of books on there, right? And and so it'll work best, I think. Uh, the goal is to say it's a word of mouth machine, you know? It's also a memory machine. So that when I tell my children, you know, this. Fleetwood Mac Rumors album is a very important album for you to listen to. They go, mm -hmm. it's not just me saying it, it's there in the vault, right? They go, boom, oh yeah, dad was talking about this album, I'll listen to it. You know, it's like, and if you, if you, somebody recommends something in the past, you write it down on a little note in your phone, right? Here mm -hmm. is a tri vault, you just stick it in there. So when you're home on a Friday night, you're like, what's in my tri vault? You're like, oh yeah, this uh, new BBC three documentary I wanted to see. I remember I wrote it down and there it is, try it. And so it's, it's a machine that I hope is going to change the way specifically film is judged the way, you know, I want reviewers on there. I'm talking, I'm trying to get Owen Gleiberman and trying to get Drew McQueenie and trying nice, to get them all nice. to go, Hey guys, I, tell me what you love, right? Tell me the films you love that nobody knows about, and then I'll watch them. You know, I, I, I'm not trying to kill reviewers. I'm, I'm, I am trying to, to kill Rotten Tomatoes. <laughs> I, I am. Well, it is a revenge ploy. It is a revenge ploy. You are not the only, sir. You are not the only one who uh, f feels some vengeance is needed against Rotten Tomatoes. Many filmmakers, <laughs> many filmmakers, feel the same way you are. And well, I, they I all get on this app and let's show them who we are. <laughs> Fantastic. And last question: Three of your favorite films of all time. Forty-eight hours. Genius. Walter Hill. Reservoir Dogs. And Goodfellas. Rest in peace, Ray Liotta. They're Rest all the reason they're all on that list is because they're all tough, funny films, mm -hmm. and I like I like it when the guy, when the people are tough in the movie, uh, and I like when they're when it's that funny and it's that you know it's sometimes you know violent and funny is so, is some sometimes really funny, but they play it straight. Forty eight hours, you're like, it's, yeah. Mm. There's some broad stuff, but there's some it, the bad guys are bad. The violence is ter is terrifying, and and obviously Goodfellas is the same way. It's funny as hell. Um, yeah, the Joe Pesci scene alone, incredible, incredible. <laughs>
Uh, I can't believe Ray Liotta died. Uh, and I then, know. Um, I know. Uh, Reservoir Dogs is to work. It's a work. It's, it's, it's a, it's a, a masterpiece. A masterpiece. Yeah. Jay. Um, and when is um, Easter Easter Sunday coming up? August fifth. Man, I cannot wait to see it. And Jay, thank you so much for coming on the show, man, and and sharing your adventures and your knowledge with uh, and your experiences with the tribe, man. I really appreciate you. Thank you for your inspiration. And just like you were inspired by Ed Burns and and Clerks and Kevin and, and Mariachi and all those kind of films, people listening now hopefully will be inspired by you. It's like, if this guy can do it. That's right. <laughs> yeah, that's right. If that guy can do it. I mean, that's what John Oliver said to me when I was I was directing him in community. He'd never <laughs> acted before. And I'd seen him do stand up and I, I loved him as stand up. Oh, he's amazing. And I said, John, his first acting scene ever. And then like, are you nervous at all? And he goes, how hard could it be? <laughs> <laughs> A pleasure yeah. meeting you, my friend. Thank you again for being on the show, brother. Continued success, and I can't wait to see Easter Sunday, man. Thanks again. Vouch for Indie Hustle, buddy. I'm going to put Indie Hustle in my vouch vault. I pre- Indie Film Hustle, I appreciate you, brother. Thank you again, man. Okay, cool.